Good morning, everyone. Apologize for the delay. Um, the doors were locked this morning. Do we have sound? Uh, everybody's shaking their head yes. Um, so I locked everyone out uh, this morning. Um, and so we just rushed in and got this all set up. Um, I'm going to take the mask off. It seems to be just large and dangly. Uh, we're back to masks, unfortunately, uh, indoors here at Cal. We're going to start that uh today so um i just uh every all of us just wish we could get this thing under control uh we'll have to do our part again so uh midterm last night so again uh that went well uh the average is going to be uh around 70 probably a little bit above 70 um so great uh you guys are getting it um uh, and the mean is around 72, so a relatively um, even distribution. Uh, so I think that's that makes it a good exam if it's an even distribution. Uh, some people still got, a couple of people got all the points. I think the perfect exam, and I know the people who got all the points don't think this, but the perfect exam is there aren't a lot of 100%. Uh, so that everybody, you know, there was a challenging question or, or something for everyone. Um, uh, but they can be challenging and still get them right. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, in general, if 99 is the highest, I'm happier. Uh, but I'm delighted for you guys that, that uh, got all the points. Um, and I hope you did indeed get all the points because there, the, there are the three that we're going to grade <laughs> uh, manually. Your score could go up or down, actually, um, because the numerical ones that you entered, uh, we have to... We have a little algorithm to grade, and we're still working on that. So uh, that'll happen. Uh, the midterm bonus question we'll do tomorrow morning. Uh, an announcement went out like that uh, about this this morning. You'll see it uh, in your B course announcements. Uh, and you can't see the exam right now. Uh, I should have mentioned that earlier. I apologize. Uh, there are uh, uh, many more than usual people needed to take the exam this morning because of uh, all the remote people do it. And then uh, there were a couple uh uh urgent and last minute things so that number got so big that i decided to just not release it, just hide it uh for security um until everybody gets done with the exam so you'll be able to see it um this morning or later today after we get it uh graded and uh released uh and of course the correct answers are withheld uh until after we do the the midterm bonus on wednesday but at least you'll be able to see your your uh, actual responses again um this afternoon so uh, i think that's it uh uh so we can get going um we're going to move into our next topic so this is another little shift uh we're going from gases to equilibria again heterogeneous equilibria and now Heterogeneous equilibria will use our properties of gases, again, because we're talking about equilibria where the phases are different. So uh, gases dissolving in liquids, solids dissolving in liquids. So there's a different phase, a solid or a gas phase in equilibrium with a dissolved phase. So we're going to start talking about solutions more. And the rest of the class, solutions, concentrations, are going to be very important. Our equilibrium expressions, we will have combinations of pressures and concentrations. And you'll become much more familiar with uh, concentrations and the terms because you'll be doing the calculations. We'll use this symbol AQ to indicate that's aqueous solution, so gaseous carbon dioxide in equilibrium with aqueous carbon dioxide. There'll be some concentration of carbon dioxide molecules in the water. Uh, you're familiar with it. That's a carbonated beverage. That's sparkling water. Uh, flat or sparkling, uh, that should have been. <laughs> or tap. Uh, some people call it tap or sparkling. Um, uh, that should be uh, the first chem quiz of the morning. What do we prefer, tap or sparkling? There's really only one answer to that, isn't there? <laughs> so uh, gases dissolve in water, 
and we could write an equilibrium expression. There's the concentration of carbon dioxide, aqueous phase there, over the partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, over the solution. So products over reactants, a pressure and a concentration. That gives us uh, an equilibrium constant. And in this case, this is a particular case where we do uh, kind of keep track of the units of an equilibrium constant. Uh, normally it's a dimensionless quantity, but we're a, a little more, um, uh, we're a little more imprecise in that we throw in some units here so we can track uh, the concentration and the pressures. So we catalog these uh, by concentration and we'll look at that here. So the solubility of gases, here are various values of that K for various gases that can dissolve in water. So the equilibrium expression is the dissolved gas is that constant equilibrium constant K times the partial pressure of the gas. So that's just rearranging the equilibrium expression. And that's why we, are we having autofocus problems? Oh, you got a you got a light there, so that probably fixed it. Am I in focus? Uh, so we have a um, equilibrium expression rearranged, and that uh, makes it a little more clear why we might put the uh, units here because we want to calculate a concentration concentration from the partial pressure of the gas over the solution. How much gets dissolved? for a given pressure over the solution. Uh, and we catalog them in millimolar. Uh, that's what that unit is. Millimoles per liter, 10 to the minus three moles per liter aqueous solution per atmosphere of gas. So you can see this reflects then the solubility of the gas. We're gonna use that term a lot now. Solubility is the um, extent to which something dissolves, some things that are highly soluble dissolve to a great extent. Insoluble means it doesn't dissolve very much. So uh, helium is not particularly soluble in the liquid phase. Going all the way down here, carbon dioxide, you can see 100 times-ish more soluble than helium. And then Ammonia, very, very soluble in uh, ammonia gas, very soluble in water. Uh, this is due uh, to a couple things uh, that happen as the ammonia gas dissolves in uh, water. So there are the various um, different uh, solubilities. The oxygen solubility in liquid is important for how uh, our respiration works. Uh, nitrogen, also soluble in uh, our bloodstream. Helium, less so. Uh, our bloodstream, uh, we can treat as uh, liquid water for to a great extent. Uh, so let's, let's look at now... Uh, a demonstration of the how dramatically soluble ammonia NH3 is in water. So uh, we have uh, Lonnie queued up here in uh, the lab, Lonnie's lab. So let's bring that here, front and center. There's also. Uh, so what Lonnie's going to do here is he has a flask that has gaseous ammonia in it. He's got it sealed there with some film. He's going to take it and place it. There's a, uh, a glass tube here and a stopper so he can seal that ammonia flask. So there's ammonia in this bulb, and he's sealing it uh, so it doesn't escape. And then he has a little syringe here that he can inject just a bit of water, tiny bit of water. Now look at what's happening. Water is forced up through there, uh, through that tube in a, in an amazing fountain. Now what's going on there? Well, the ammonia 
is so soluble in just that little speck of water that we had there uh, originally that it dissolves. And what is what does that happen? It's a gas dissolving in the liquid, a gas leaving the gas phase. So the pressure in this bulb dramatically reduces. And that reduction in pressure in the bulb allows the atmosphere to push that up into, that's not sucking <laughs> that's occurring. Oh, <laughs> we, uh, oh gosh. <laughs> Go to blank. We don't want to run any ads here in the classroom. <laughs> Go to black. <laughs> That's horrible. Uh, it looks like somebody else is going to do the ammonia. Oh, my God. Let's not look at that guy either. Whoa, my. <laughs> Yikes. Whoo. <laughs> so, um, so what you saw there uh, was a dramatic. It's another expression of the weight, the, the uh, mass of the atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere dramatically uh, shown there, that reduction in pressure in the top of the flask, the difference in pressures, uh, the atmosphere forcing that liquid up. It's also a dramatic demonstration of the free energy of that, that process, that dissolving process. So that's an equilibrium that we know. It has an equilibrium constant, K, and we saw it was a big number, 10,000, 10 to the fourth. So a very large K. So that lies very far towards the dissolved gas, and that has a large free energy associated with it. So the free energy change for going from the gas to the dissolved gas is large. And that free energy released when the gas dissolves, that is equivalent to the amount of work, the available work the system can do. And that work was used dramatically to lift a liter of water, essentially a meter into the air. So there's a, a dramatic ex, uh, demonstration of a lot of things we understand about thermodynamics and equilibria and free energy being the work we can get from a system. So let's do a chem quiz uh, related to that. So a solution here has equal concentrations of helium and nitrogen in the uh, liquid water. So we know those concentrations are equal. What does that say about the partial pressures of helium and neon gas above the solution? So there's a gas phase. Poopy. There's helium and nitrogen gas here, and there is some nitrogen and helium dissolved at an equal concentration in the liquid. So let's talk about that in our groups, and we'll take a vote. <laughs> I seem to be able to launch these styluses. Styly. Okay. Think about that for a second.
Okay, we've had a few minutes to talk about that. Let's see what you're thinking. Enter uh, response if you have not yet done so. Uh, C is quite popular, uh, judging by the distribution there. And uh, I agree with the Cs. Let's go through the reasoning on that. So the key was understanding. You have these in your uh, handouts and notes. Uh, the difference... Nitrogen and, oh, it's not that, that different. We put the wrong number when we were thinking about it. Uh, the difference between the helium solubility and the nitrogen gas solubility. So helium and nitrogen at equal concentrations, if you look at the relative Ks, the relative value of K, this was 0 0.4 for helium and 0 0.7 for nitrogen. So nitrogen has the higher K, it's more soluble. You get a higher concentration for a given pressure. So the expression is the concentration is the K value times the pressure uh, value. In this case, it was N2 or helium. So the larger the K, the more soluble. So you need, uh, you don't need as much pressure to get the same concentration. Or if you have a small K, you need more pressure to get the same concentration as a more soluble gas. So indeed, we need a higher pressure of helium to get the same concentration as nitrogen. So the partial pressure is above the flask. Uh, Pressure of helium is higher than the pressure of nitrogen above the flask. Uh, and that brings up an interesting point. Are there anybody, uh, we have Leo here in uh, uh, one of your UGSIs who's a, a diver. Um, this is important consideration for scuba diving. We talked about uh, diving previously. So the fact that nitrogen is relatively soluble and it gets more soluble, more is goes into solution as the pressure increases. So if you are a diver and you dive down uh, under the ocean pressures, deep ocean pressures, and you're breathing compressed air, nitrogen dissolves in your blood more than it would at the surface. And you get a high concentration of uh, nitrogen gas dissolved in your blood. As you ascend, the nitrogen, the pressure drops, and what happens? The nitrogen gas wants to leave solution. So the, the equilibrium shifts by Le Chatelier. I go back to the gas phase, but it comes back to the gas phase uh, bubbling out of your blood in your bloodstream. <laughs> Die, yeah, that hurts. Uh, it's called the bends. It B E N D S. Uh, you can get the bends. Uh, it's called the bends because uh, the bubbles uh, collect in your joints, and you go like you're all bent and painful uh, with the nitrogen gas bubbling out uh, of your system. Um, what what deep divers do actually? They mix their oxygen with helium instead of nitrogen. So they have a special mixture in their tank. Rather than straight compressed air, you can use a helium oxygen mixture, which might would make you sound funny. <laughs> you would talk in that crazy helium voice. Uh, you don't do a lot of uh, conversing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's less soluble and much more permeable to your membranes. So also it it uh, it doesn't collect as much as gas bubbles. It uh, uh, permeates through the membranes um, and um, vesicles in your body. So it's a little uh, less painful. And uh, you have, you may have seen on the movies, decompression chambers. You rise to a certain uh, uh, 
depth and you hold there, or you go immediately into a decompression chamber when you come to the surface and that high pressure of nitrogen gas is maintained and slowly decreased so that the process of the gas coming out of your bloodstream is lower. Uh, those, the, 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 so there's these tables, uh, of when you, when you have a dive table, it tells you how long you can stay down at a given depth, uh, and prevent, you know, to be able to have a safe ascent and prevent the bends. Um, and those are empirical tables. Uh, empirical means by experiment, <laughs> they, they had to figure out how long people could stay and there isn't a good calculation. So uh, most of those tables were developed by uh, uh, the Marines, uh, Marine scuba divers. They just sent them down and, you know, hit the stopwatch. When they come up, oh, you look like you're in pain. Too long. <laughs> and they would just <laughs> make a table based on uh, screaming Marines. <laughs> uh, interesting historical note. <laughs> So let's uh, talk through uh, uh, this. Actually, uh, let's let's do this in our groups because this again is bringing in uh, what you understand about K and T. This is just an equilibrium constant and uh, temperature. So on a warm day, your soda can uh, expands. The pressure inside the soda can becomes higher. What does that tell you about the dissolution reaction uh, of carbon dioxide? So carbon dioxide dissolving to become aqueous carbon dioxide. Is that exothermic, isothermal, or endothermic? Think about that for a minute. And we will take a vote. I think it started.
Let's see what you're thinking on that one. It looks like most of us have responded already. Uh, we're uh, all equally split between uh, a few more think exothermic than endothermic. Uh, so let's go through this. This is a good kind of uh, final exam question because it brings back the relationship between K and T. So you have this expression here and you have the equilibrium constant that's uh, governing the equilibrium pressure and concentration. And we're saying as temperature increases, this pressure is increasing. That pressure is increasing because the can is expanding. So as the pressure increases, what does that mean about the size of K with the temperature? Well, if the equilibrium pressure is higher, then that K value is smaller at higher temperatures. So K smaller at higher temperatures is what we're seeing. Does that correspond to the endothermic process or the exothermic process? Well, if it's an exothermic process, then there's some heat released. So we did this hand wavy thing, and this is not uh, exact, but we said Le Chatelier's principle, if you add heat, that will force the reaction back towards reactants. So an exothermic process would go back towards reactants at higher temperature, and that higher temperature means there's more gas phase, K getting smaller with temperature for exothermic processes. K getting smaller, reactants being more favored. So reactants are the gas phase. So I, I probably plot that somewhere. Let's see if I do. Yep. So this is a figure that we had back uh, when we were talking about K and T. We talked about uh, an exact relationship, delta G is RT, ln K. So we had a, uh, a, a relationship between K and T that we could solve and get a relationship, but there's also the Le Chatelier's argument that gave us the same kind of result. So that's bringing together a lot of things that we've done throughout the class. So if you understood that, that's great. Uh, solubility of ionic solid. So now let's do the solid liquid, solid aqueous. Uh, so we did gases. Now we'll put a little bit of barium sulfate in our solution there. And barium sulfate is sparingly soluble. It doesn't dissolve very much. That means this reaction does not go very far towards the ions. So we're going to talk about this now quite a bit for the rest of the class, ions in solution. This is an ionic solid, it's a salt. So there's an ionic bond holding it together and ionic bonds can break apart in solution. If they break apart in solution, you get the barium ions and the sulfate ions in solution at some concentration. So this reaction, this dissolving reaction is uh, something we can write an equilibrium expression for. We can write a Q or a K. And we would write it, uh, as you know, the products, the barium concentration, the sulfate ion concentration, over the reactants. But in this case, the reactant is a pure solid, and pure solids do not appear in equilibrium expressions. So the equilibrium expression is, rather than a quotient, it's a product because the solid doesn't appear. So for dissolving, we sometimes give uh, K, the designation KSP, solubility product. Uh, that doesn't change anything. It's still an equilibrium constant. Everything we know about equilibrium constant still applies. It's just reminding us that it's a solubility product. So you'll see that in uh, your reading, but don't be put off. It's just a K. It's still a function of T. Um, and the product of those concentrations at equilibrium is a set value. And that's the important thing. 
We're going to start to deal with equilibria now for the rest of the class. We're going to talk about aqueous equilibria in solution. And if there is any barium sulfate solid in this flask, then the equilibrium will exist. So this holds as long as there is some solid. The solid doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression, but this equilibrium will not hold unless the solid is there. And this equilibrium will hold with the solid there regardless of what else is in solution. All equilibria that are in solution, all equilibria all the time, coexist. All equilibrium expressions must be satisfied when you have a mixture of things going on. We saw that when we talked about multiple equilibria, and we're going to use that fact a lot through the rest of the course. So this KSP, it's an exceedingly small number. We're going to start talking about, for the rest of the course, Ks that are tiny. That means reactions that don't really go uh, were boring for the rest of the semester. <laughs> you put barium sulfate in a flask, almost nothing happens. 10 to the minus 10 is the equilibrium expression. So what are these concentrations? Well, they're going to be equal if I just dissolve barium sulfate. So that concentration and that concentration are equal, and their product has to be 10 to the minus 10. So if I say, well, let X be the concentration of the barium and the sulfate, then X squared, X times X, has to be 10 to the minus 10. So the concentrations are 10 to the minus fifth, the square root of 10 to the minus 10. Uh, so the concentrations are, are very, very, very small. So uh, if we put uh, a little uh, gram of barium sulfate in our liter of water, the concentrations of barium and sulfate in solution come up to 10 to the minus fifth molar. So a 10,000th uh, ish of a mole per liter. So incredibly tiny amount dissolves because of that tiny K. And we're going to say this, small Ks mean products are not favored. Reactants are favored. And we're going to do that for the rest of the class. We're going to deal with small Ks. We're in the, the boring phase of Chem 1A. So which of the following will we required in the least amount to dissolve a speck of barium sulfate. So you put a little barium sulfate in there. It gets into equilibrium with barium and sulfate ions. So some of it dissolves, and there's a little bit left. Can you get the rest to dissolve? So should I add a solution of H2SO4, and that dissolves to H2 ions or H plus ions and sulfate minus two ions. Barium chloride, that's also a soluble salt. So you get barium ions and chloride ions, or just add straight water. And we'll talk through this one together. Uh, uh, I think in, intuitively, you should probably say uh, add water. And uh, of course, adding water will work. The question is, uh, what's the least? amount. Uh, should I have water with these salts already in it? Will those help? Or just straight water is the question. So if I uh, dump water in, that's analogous. That's increasing the volume of the system. And if we increase the volume of the system, that gives more room. It's just like a gas. You increase the volume, you give more room you can hold more moles at the same pressure. Same thing here. You increase the volume of the liquid, more room for the ions, and more will dissolve. The concentrations are moles per liter. So if you get more liters, you get more moles dissolved. So you can make it dissolve just by adding water. And you're probably intuitively aware of that. If you have some, you're trying to make sugar water for your hummingbirds or something, you put the sugar in the bottom, you pour water in. If it doesn't all dissolve, then you add more water and, and get it to dissolve. Uh, you're looking for four parts, uh, volume, volume, four parts sugar, four part, uh, uh, one part sugar to four parts water. If you're interested in feeding hummingbirds, that's a good mix to go for. Uh, 
up at uh, the ranch in the Sierras where we uh, grow uh, berries. Um, I cultivate the hummingbirds because I like the hummingbirds down there when I'm uh, trellising or harvesting or whatever I'm doing down in the berry garden. And uh, there's so many hummingbirds. Uh, I They go through uh, over two gallons of sugar water, <laughs> two gallons uh, in about five days. <laughs> so, and you know how much they drink at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but the hummingbirds they're like sometimes it's almost annoying there's so many of them buzzing back and forth uh why did we get on to oh we're dissolving things uh so sorry about that distraction uh it's fun i hope you all can someday join me at the ranch and i'll tell you i need you because the berries are coming in so much and i'm here all the time uh uh they're gonna rot on the vine we have to have people go up and pick um so water will work will barium chloride or uh this is sulfuric acid h2so4 will that help well let's look at that so here's the dissolution reaction the barium ions and the sulfate ions are in solution this is a soluble salt barium chloride so if you go look up in a table ksp values you'll get them for salts but only for salts that aren't very soluble because that would mean there's a small k that you can record for things that are very soluble what is the size of k ginormous so if i go all the way if i'm very soluble if i go all the way to products it's products over reactants reactants are tiny products are huge, that number gets large very fast. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1A, take home the fact that large K means I go all the way to completion. The bigger the K, the farther I go towards completion. And the converse, small K means I don't go very far towards reactants. Small K boring, large K fun. <laughs> so this totally dissolves. That means for every mole of barium chloride you put in, you get a mole, uh, you get two moles of chloride ions and a mole of barium ions. Uh, does that help? Well, Le Chatelier says no. Le Chatelier says, well, if I have barium there and I want this reaction to go in that direction, making the barium concentration higher does not help. That's worse. So this barium ion concentration forces the reaction back the other way. And sulfuric acid, H2SO4, we'll talk about this a ton uh, in the last couple of weeks of class here. Same thing. That increases this ion concentration. So this is a common ion effect. You're adding a, these reactions all have uh, ions in common. That means all the equilibria have to be true at the same time. These concentrations are very high. They flood the system with this and this. That means these concentrations must go down even further for that equilibrium to be held. So I make the barium sulfate less soluble. So just pure water is the way to go there. So that is called the common ion effect. And we can apply Le Chatelier's principle to determine how the common ion effect works. Um, getting quite bright here. Should I uh, get a little less? Ooh, that's a lot less. Oh, let's leave it open. Um, the common ion will affect, as we've seen, the concentrations. How does that work? Well, let's say I had barium sulfate, a speck of barium sulfate, in the presence of 0.1 molar sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now, the K is very large, so 0.1 molar H2SO4, we can interpret as dissolving all the way and giving us 0.1 moles per liter. Well, that's what I've said, 0.1 molar, 0.1 moles per liter H2SO4. That means I took 0.1 mole of H2SO4 and I put it in one liter. It totally dissolved, giving us 0.1 moles of sulfate ions per liter. So K large, take that to the bank, uh, very much bigger than one. And one, of course, is the cutoff. If you're bigger than one, you go to products. If you're less than one, 
it's a quotient. If you're less than one, you stay uh, at reactants. So if I calculate the concentration, I say, well, if a little of the barium dissolves, barium sulfate dissolves, I'd get X moles of barium ion in solution and X moles of sulfate in solution. Uh, except this equilibrium also holds, which goes all the way to here. So those 0.1 moles per liter are there, plus whatever you get from the barium dissolving. So what I'm doing is enforcing both these equilibria to happen at the same time. And I can do it simply because this equilibrium is so big that I can say it goes to completion. So I don't have to do two K expressions. This one's huge. And so I'll just say it goes all the way and I get 0.1 moles. And this guy just has to deal with it. <laughs> I'm dissolving all the way, deal with it. So how do I deal with it? I enter that equilibrium concentration into this equilibrium expression. So that means that equilibrium, the product of those two concentrations, so this is barium concentration and sulfate ion concentration, they still have to be KSP if there's any barium sulfate present. This equilibrium must hold. So that means I have to take into account that this concentration went crazy high on us to 0.1 molar. That affects the overall concentration of both these things because the product has to be 10 to the minus 10. We said that this is a very tiny equilibrium constant. So that has to be 10 to the minus 10. These concentrations have to be very low but I've made this one artificially high. What does that mean about this one? It has to be incredibly low because I made that one high. And in fact, since this is so small, we can say that X is going to be incredibly small. So how do I know that? Well, K is small. I don't go very far towards products. So these concentrations are going to be small. And I'm going to guess, in fact, I know they're very much smaller than 0.1. I already did the calculation. Remember, we said in pure water, the barium and sulfate concentrations were 10 to the minus 5. That's 10,000 times less than 0.1. So yes, Xs are small compared to 0.1. That means forget about the X in the math. So this is approximately x times 0.1. This x is small. Forget about it compared to 0.1. So it's that x times 0.1 is 10 to the minus 10th, the equilibrium concentration. That means the barium ion concentrations are 10 to the minus 9-ish. So much less of this dissolve, 10 to the minus 9. The sulfate ion concentrations, what are those? 0.1. So the product of 0.1 and 10 to the minus 9, so 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 9 has to be 10 to the minus 10. So you see it in there. The product of the sulfate ion concentrations and the barium concentrations, I'm going to write that up there to reemphasize it. The product of the barium ion concentrations and those concentrations, there they are, that is fixed at 10 to the minus 10. That product must be true. It's a K. So that means if this is 0.1, that has to be 10 to the minus 9. Okay? We understand that based on Le Chatelier's principle. We understand that uh, if I added that sulfate after the fact, so let's say that wasn't there and the barium and sulfate ions were equal concentration at 10 to the minus fifth. And then I added this. Then the barium ions, the concentration has to go very well far down. How does it go down? It precipitates out of solution. It grabs one of those available sulfates. Now there's billions of them. It grabs one and jumps back to the solid, reducing the aqueous concentration. 
So that's a precipitation reaction. You add sulfate to barium sulfate solution, the solid forms. You can often see it. It precipitates out of solution. And uh, you make your salt. It's a mess, usually. You, it, when, you're, when you're a chemist and you're doing stuff and something precipitates, you're usually upset. Sometimes you're trying to get that thing to precipitate. Often you want stuff to stay in solution so it reacts. Uh, so that brings up something interesting. Let's, let's say we did that kind of thing. Let's say we got barium and sulfate ions into solution artificially. So it, it, if you put barium sulfate solid in, that's not a way, good way to get barium and sulfate ion concentrations high. Barium sulfate doesn't dissolve. But we see there are barium salts that do. Barium hydroxide dissolves. This K is large. This K, we said, is large. So the dissolving of both these things is large. So these Ks that are very much bigger than one mean if I mix these two things, that's going to make barium concentrations and sulfate concentrations high. But we know that cannot be. You will not pass. <laughs> <laughs> Gandalf says that cannot be because this says barium and sulfate can never be in solution at greater than 10 to the minus 10th product it can never happen I've written it in reverse here because let's say those react they were trying to increase in solution this says no that and that go that way. So if I write it this way, that this K is large. It's one over the KSP. So that goes hard in that direction. That goes hard in that direction. That goes hard in that direction. But these two together go hard in that direction. And also the H plus, H plus plus OH minus. Those are the other two things being produced. That goes hard in that direction. This K is ginormous, 10 to the uh, plus 14. This is 10 to the plus 11. So these two things are going to uh, go. So I can't just mix these two things together and get any barium and sulfate in solution because the barium and sulfate ions will come out of solution. So I do it this way. I put the barium and hydroxide, the barium hydroxide in a beaker here, and the H2SO4 in this burette. And I can dribble in by drops the H2SO4, and that's going to make the sulfate ion concentration go up. But that will make every sulfate that comes in there, the barium, the greedy bariums are grabbing them and making solid. So every little sulfate that I add here gets grabbed by a barium ion and turns into a solid at the bottom of the flask. And that'll continue to happen until I use up all my barium ions. That process is called titration. If you titrate something, you add it in small amounts until you just balance some concentrations. So if you add this, H2SO4, until you just use up all the barium that's there, so you put a sulfate in for every barium that was already there, all the barium ions, you can make them go very close to zero, and you can make the sulfate ions go very close to zero. Not exactly zero, because this always holds, so the product is always 10 to the minus 10, but you can get them very, very small. The concentration's down to 10 to the minus fifth each. So that's called uh, titration, where you add things until you get to where you want to be. You get to the equilibrium that you are interested in. You can see that happen. Um, so the barium hydroxide solution conducts electricity. It conducts electricity because it has ions in it. So if you have ions in solution, ionic water is more conductive than pure distilled water. 
you put pure distilled water in, it's actually not a very good conductor. Electricity does not flow that well through pure water. Um, and that's one of the things that we kind of get messed up in the popular media too. You see, um, you see people, uh, you know, uh, a puddle on the floor, an electric current, um, pure distilled water isn't that conductive. So you need very high voltages. Still don't mix electricity and water. Absolutely not. If the voltage is high enough, you'll get current to flow, but, uh, it's like lightning. <laughs> Everything conducts electricity if you go to high enough voltage. <laughs> you can make the electrons go. Sometimes it takes a lightning bolt, like for a tree to conduct electricity. <laughs> In general, if you hook a battery to a tree, <laughs> you're not going to get any conduction. The voltage isn't high enough. But a lightning bolt, <laughs> that, that makes the tree conductive, and the electricity goes down the tree into the ground. Um, same thing here. Uh, if I have more ions in solution, though, that makes it more conductive. And you can probably understand why. Those charges, charged species, help the electrons. Elec uh, conduction is the process of electrons moving. And these ions can act as electron carriers. They're moving around and diffusing so they can help the electrons across. And in this case, they'd help the electrons across from one electrode to another electrode, and you could turn on a light bulb because electrons could flow through that um, system there. So the more ions, the brighter the light that you'll have there. So as you add H2SO4, what happens, we'll talk about that in terms of a chem quiz. Think about this for a minute in your groups. I do this titration. I start with barium hydroxide. I add dropwise sulfuric acid. What is the correct plot of the conductance? Essentially, how bright is the light per added uh, mole of H2SO4? Think about that for a second. We shall take a vote. <sighs> okay, Sophia, that was... Long and hard. Oops.
let's come back together and take a stab if you haven't yet. And we'll talk through this. We're going a little slow here. Let's see what you're thinking. Uh, uh, not unanimous by any stretch of the imagination. A few more of us, about a third of us think uh, B and then the other two thirds uh, A and C. Let me give you my thoughts on that. I agree with the Bs. Oops. <laughs> no explanation. I just agree with you. <laughs> is there any more animation than that? Okay. Yes, there is some. It's in the wrong order. Uh, so uh, after all the barium sulfate is produced, the excess uh, conducts. What do I mean by that? So uh, let's go back. So this is in the beaker. Lots of barium ions and lots of hydroxide ions. Why? Because K is gigantic. Then you start adding this, and that K is gigantic. So you get sulfate ions. But you cannot have sulfate and barium ions in solution together because this is gigantic. Those two things together make the solid. So ions are sucked from solution. Every barium finds a sulfate. And every hydroxide, that ion, finds one of those. And this says that shall not stand. H plus and OH minus cannot be together in solution. That K 10 to the plus 14. This K 10 to the plus 11. Everything goes that way. Ions crash out of solution. The ionic strength goes down dramatically. That says that it has to be a B or C. A is not an option. It happens rapidly and uh, uh, immediately. You always assume when you're doing a titration that you're at equilibrium at every step anyway. So if it didn't happen fast, you'd have to wait. <laughs> but the problem is once you get there, if you're plotting the equilibrium points, then it drops down dramatically. It does happen fast, I will just tell you, just for your own edification. So. Uh, why, though, is it B and not C? Well, right at this point, this is the point you were interested in. This is where you've added uh, one BA. The BA plus twos were there, and you've added one SO4 minus two for every BA plus two that was there, and you've used them all up and therefore used them up you're at the lowest possible ion concentration. Here, that's the what you'd call the end point of your titration. You've succeeded in removing everything. But then the next drop of H2SO4, there's no more bariums to take your sulfates out. But this K didn't stop being huge. So this produces ions, and they will begin to conduct again. Uh, so we can see that happen. We can do that. Uh, conductometric titration. Uh, here, I uh, believe I have it. Come on, baby. Get rid of crazy man. <laughs> Go to another crazy man. <laughs> Just a different crazy man. <laughs> so here I have the setup. Back in the day, um, uh, there's the light bulb, the ions, the barium hydroxide solution, the H2SO4 solution in the um, burette. So I'm going to, I got a little mixer down there. I'm going to add uh, barium sulfate. I'm going to add H2SO4 to the barium solution, and we're going to note the uh, brightness of the light. 
So see it dribbling, dribble, 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 dribble in. Look at the uh, intensity of the light. Brilliant camera work. You see the solid barium sulfate precipitating out. Solids can't conduct electricity anymore. That light getting dimmer and dimmer as I add it. And I'm going to come down a little smaller there. And if you're very careful, but we know you got to be very careful because the next drop, after you use up all the ions, the next drop of H2SO4 is going to start conducting again. So there, light out as far as you can go. Ion concentrations are not zero because barium and sulfate ions are now obeying the equilibrium expression that says their product has to be 10 to the minus 10. So they're very small, but not zero. But the next uh, drop I add, I don't know if I do that. I forget. This was a long time ago. This is in the before times, as far as you guys are concerned. Um, quick, Gavin. Add more. Okay. Uh, I turn it on, add more, and immediately the light comes back on. Okay. I like that guy, but he talks too much. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's just do a uh, calculation here. Uh, what's the solubility of silver chloride? It has a, it's not very soluble in water and 0.2 molar sodium chloride. So in pure water, this is the equilibrium expression we're talking about, silver chloride, silver ions, and chlorine ions. Uh, that the product in pure water is 10 to the minus 10. So I do this uh, expression here um, that says uh, initially, right when I drop the bit of solid in, the concentration of those ions are zero. That's initial, that's not equilibrium. They're going to change. They're going to get bigger. The amount they change, I'm going to say, well, X moles of that dissolves. It'll give me X moles per liter of chlorine and X moles per liter of uh, silver. So those concentrations will be the same as a little bit. So that's the change is a little bit dissolves. At equilibrium, it's the sum of those two. In this case, it's boring because it started at zero. But if there was some there to start with, and you can see, Later, I'll have some of this there to start with. Then the sum is the equilibrium concentrations. So uh, this thing, <laughs> ICE, uh, this is called, I, I didn't know this. Um, uh, someone came into my office one day and said, uh, how do I do the ice table? <laughs> I, I had no idea. When I was taking chemistry, I'm sure that's an old term, and people have called that ice for a long time. I had no idea <laughs> what ice table meant. This is it. It's how you, uh, it's this acronym for initial concentrations, change, and equilibrium. It's how you set up an equilibrium calculation, ice table. Um, so if I put in now the equilibrium concentrations are X, so x times x must be 10 to the minus 10th. That's what equilibrium means. Then I can calculate the concentration of each of them. They're equal, and they're about 10 to the minus 5th. We already did that, and we already did this uh, kind of as well. Let's say I put in 0.2 molar sodium chloride. K for that, you may know, sodium chloride, that's table salt, very high. You get chlorine ions. So your initial conditions, if you had this in solution already, you already have 0.2 molar um, chloride ions. So now when a little of this dissolves, it tries to add ions to solution. So you say that's how much X, and then the sum of those is the equilibrium concentrations. So now it's X times 0.02 plus X is 10 to the minus 10. And I do the same old boring thing. I say, I know X is small because K is small. So it's small compared to 0 
and I say x times 0.2 is 10 to the minus 10, and that means the concentration is 10 to the minus 9 of the silver ions. So the solubility, the amount of silver that chloride that could dissolve is limited because I can't put any more chlorine ions in solution. Those chlorine ions are forcing it back this way. The solubility is now 10 to the minus 9 moles per liter. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce here then um, more small k interactions. So if I have uh, a very famous class, and we'll spend most of the rest of the class talking about this, uh, a very famous class of chemical reactions or dissolution reactions are acids and bases. And the interesting ones have small k's. Uh, interesting because they they do things um uh we said big k's are exciting uh and that's true they go to completion but they're also <laughs> they're boring in the respect that pff, they all go and then nothing happens after that so um the the going all the way to completion is exciting but then done uh so you sit around the small k's they hold back so they can keep Reacting if other things happen, they hold back a little bit of reactants. So small k's can be more interesting. Um, and we're going to look at both big and small k reactions. First, let's define what I talk about acid base equilibrium. So an acid is a compound that can donate a an H plus. An H plus can be removed from it. So acids are compounds that are H plus donors. They donate H pluses. The better they do that, the better the acid they are. And when I donate an H plus, uh, an H plus ion, you know what that is. It's a hydrogen minus its electron. So it's just a proton. Take a proton and electron, take away the electron, you just have a proton. So I'm going to call H plus protons all the time. So just so you know, H pluses, I mean proton, same thing. OK, uh, you'll do it, too. So it's a proton donor. HA donated its proton to this B, and now its proton is on the B. So acids are things like H3O plus that can donate a proton, HAC. And now uh, this is acetic acid, and I've written most of the formula as just AC. I've abbreviated it. Because the only important thing that we care about about acetic acid is that proton that comes off. So all the rest doesn't matter. It's just the other ion. So I'll go to H plus and AC minus. Uh, we'll write the formula for AC minus later. But the important thing for us is the proton comes off. Water can act as an acid. Water can give up one of its protons. We know it doesn't do it because we saw a minute ago that the equilibrium for going the other way is 10 to the plus 14. So it does not go that way. <clears throat> so whenever this happens, whenever I lose a proton, I make the uh, conjugate ion, and that thing will be a base because a base is something that accepts protons. So by accepting a proton, I... Uh, act like a base, so that proton can be accepted. So the reverse reaction, that acts like a base. The forward reaction, this acts like an acid. So what are acids? Well, they'll, be, they'll come in pairs, acids and bases, because one will have the proton, one will not. In this case, conjugate acid base pairs. So the conjugate pair here, acid, its conjugate base is water. So if I had H3O plus here, that would be H2O. And in that case, it wouldn't be charged. So this is the generic expression. H3O plus H2O, those pairs. The conjugate pair for HAC, I'll just write as AC minus. Proton's gone. Proton on, proton off. Proton on, proton off. Proton on, proton off. These are the stronger acids, better donors going that way. Here, these are the stronger bases. 
And that should make a little bit of sense. If this thing is very good at giving up its proton, that means the equilibrium favors that. That must mean that isn't very good at taking a proton back. So if the equilibrium favors the base, then that conjugate base is not a very good acceptor. That's just basically what it means. This thing donates and that guy can't get it back. Equilibrium lies over there, but the equilibrium could lie over here and then that would be a crappy acid and the base would be stronger. So that's this case, bad acid, good base. Weak, strong, strong, weak. Okay, so that's typical of conjugate pairs, we call them. And of course, we could go the other way. If you had a base that accepts protons. So here I have accepting a proton from a proton donor. Good bases, we've already seen. OH minus ammonia, that thing we dissolved in a uh, liquid earlier, and water. But in this case, those are the stronger ones. And then their conjugate acids, H2O. I've got that proton. NH4 plus, I've got the proton. And H3O plus. Seen that conjugate pair already? And that conjugate pair already? Just in uh, the opposite context. But those are conjugate pairs and the same kind of stronger acid, weaker base uh, holds. So that's the terminology. We're going to use this. And I think you probably already can anticipate if K is large, this is a good acid. The equilibrium lies on this side. It donates its proton and it stays off. The proton stays off. That means I'm a good acid. Goes to something. Uh, so weak acids, K will be small and I won't get rid of it. I'll have a high concentration of this at equilibrium. A strong acid, I have a high concentration of this at equilibrium. And we've already seen it, H2SO4 minus, uh, so H, oopsie. Hmm. Oh, well, I can talk about it on that slide. So here it is, when this acid was, oh, don't give me a hard time. When this acid was h 2SO4, it had two, it was a double acid, a diacid. It can donate both its protons. And we said K for that going to H pluses and SO4 minuses. We said that K was huge. So that's a strong acid. You get two of those. Turns out they would both hop onto a water. They would donate to a water. So the conjugate base would be H2O here and H3O plus. So big Ks, and of course you write the equilibrium expression. And we understand H3O plus and A minus are on that side. They're the products over HA, the acid itself. And if that K is big, strong acid. Same thing, I could do it for the base. I could say, well, if you had a base that accepted a proton from water, then the products are BH plus, I've accepted the proton, and uh, OH minus. And we're going to do these things in water so often that we need to be very familiar with these. These Ks, we also give little special designations to. Ka, an acid dissociation constant. It's just a K, no, everything else applies. Notice, however, and you know this, H2O, it's products over reactants, but H2O liquid is a pure liquid, so it does not appear. Pure liquids, pure solids do not appear in the equilibrium expressions. So I have these two equilibrium expressions for acids and bases. We're gonna talk about this. This page will drive the rest of our discussion. Uh, for almost uh, for the next uh, three or four days here, um, the rest of this week, uh, we'll talk about acids and bases. Uh, so we'll see you tomorrow. We'll get our um, the exam all buttoned up for you and get the final results up today. Hopefully, it's not too hard. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow.